Uh, let's turn back to the passage we had, uh, Book of Psalms and Psalm 102. It's probably best if you have your Bibles open about Psalm. We'll be going in and out of it throughout the, the evening. So we're taking let's say, the whole Psalm in, really. Uh, a Psalm which, on first reading, is quite blunt. A Psalm that's a real Psalm. A Psalm that comes across quite honestly, as many Psalms do. Just the, the, the psalmist, the writer, pouring out his heart to God. Very often we, well, speaking personally, at least I'm sure we all do it, we are so good at putting a face on things, so good at, at looking and acting as if we've got everything sorted, uh, as if we've just cracked what it is to be a Christian, that we know how, I have no doubts, I have no worries, I never doubt anything, I'm never scared of anything, I've never... Um, had long nights crying out to God. And we put this face on, despite the fact that it's not true, and despite the fact that everyone around us has had same, if not exactly same, um, doubts, worries, and concerns. When the psalm here, the psalmist, puts no such face on, he is quite clear, quite open, and quite clear about his concerns. I was uh, speaking a few weeks ago to a friend, and he, well, his, and his wife are, are really big on, on upcycling. Um, they, they buy bits of old furniture which, <laughs> which you would throw out if it any sense, and they, they take it and they, they, they look at it and they see something wonderful there. And I went into their shed, and my goodness, it's just full of just bits of old broken chairs and tables and dressers and everything else, and it's, it's a mess. So they, I'm thinking, okay, fair enough. And then you go through to the next bit of the shed, and there they have the finished pieces. The, the, the best they've done so far is they bought a, it was a, a, a chest of drawers for £20, fallen into bits, full of woodworm, and they sold it on for £250. And this kind of skill they have of taking something which looks beyond finished and transforming it, making it useful again, and then selling it on or passing it on as something which is truly useful, which has value uh, in every sense of a word. When we come to look at this psalm, we're not too, well, we're not certain at all who offered it. We, it's not, it's not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not told who wrote it. Like Psalm 101 and Psalm 103, it tells us, it's a psalm of David. Psalm 102 it doesn't tell us who wrote it. But what it does say, look with me, if it's in your Bibles, beside the psalm number, Psalm 102. A prayer of one afflicted when he is faint and pours out his complaint before the Lord. When we come to this psalm, we're confronted with a real situation. And as we go through the psalm tonight, I want you to please, in your minds at least, to, to take off any masks you're wearing and to come before God and to go through this psalm just now and see if it applies to you anyway. And see how it does apply to you. If it does, let's look together what the psalmist says about your situation. As someone who's, who's in an awful situation, he's... We know his psalm was written when, I, I remember a time when, when his city has been, so Jerusalem and his island has been destroyed, by much we know. The man himself is in a bad situation, uh, personal wise, and also his nation around him is in a bad situation. So his personal life, his nation's a mess, his place where, where God is present, the temple, it's all gone to bits. And if we're honest here, this is a man's private prayer and it pulls no punches if you like, it's, he's plainly sharing what he's saying to God he's sharing his concerns, he's sharing his worries and he even asks God why he's found himself in such a tough situation so as we look through the psalm we can see he's not only praying for his own situation like we said, but he's also praying for his nation's situation he's praying for the church of his day if you like he comments his nation, he comments to the church, he comments himself. This man's in a situation that's completely broken. So let's look together at the psalm for a short, short time, very short time, and see what we can learn, even, even tonight, from this man and from his real honest prayer to his God. First of all, looking um, at his starting few verses, he, he, he makes clear that, that he has tears to drink. He starts with his plea to God that God would hear him. 
He has no time for any kind of eloquent words. He jumps to in. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Don't hide your face from me in the day of my distress. He's got no time for any kind of elaborate beginning to his prayer. He just jumps straight in and he says what he's feeling. God, please help me. Please listen to me. He's not just saying his prayer uh, as some routine, as some weekly or daily thing he's doing. He, he means these words. All he wants to know is that God is hearing him, that God is actually listening to his cry. This man is in need of immediate help, and we, we know that this cry is, is found again and again, of course, throughout Psalms and throughout Scripture itself. These Psalms, when we see the, the Psalms crying out for help, not spending time to say anything else, but God help me. God help me. If you haven't heard yet what's causing, of course, the suffering, we'll find it out as the psalm goes on. Oh no, now, in the first few verses, this is a man who's crying out to God, a man who needs the help of his Saviour. And this real sense of, of suffering the psalmist had, this real sense of suffering he's conveying in these few words, it links him to every Christian to every believer from his generation up to now. This man a few thousand years ago writing this a few thousand miles away is linking and can link up to us here this evening. Many Christians have cried out to God, the cry has not changed. Believers today, of course, still find themselves doing the same, if not the exact same cry out to God. We find ourselves crying out to God that he would hear us, that he would answer us quickly, that he would no longer hide his face from us. With everything else that unites us uh, as children of God, we're definitely united in this one fact, that our, our hope and our love and our only source of help is to be found in our Saviour and in our God. We're all united in some way, in some even small way perhaps, I, I was saying later on, I, later on, I don't know many people here. I don't know at all your situations. I don't know what your, what your walk of God is like. Only you know that. Even those who know you well don't know what that is like. Only you know that. But I'm sure everyone here tonight is a Christian in some way. We can relate to the fact we've all had a time. We've cried out something similar to this man to God. Something similar to this poor man's crying out. Hear my prayer, God. Let my cry come to you. Don't hide your face from me. We can see from verses 3 down to verse, well, roughly verse 5, he's, he's facing real distress. Um, his, his situation, his mindset, what's happening to him, what's happening to his nation, what's happening to his world around him, it's affecting him so much that it's having a physical effect on him. Verse 3 to 5, we see talking about his bones aching, his bones burning inside him. He, he stopped eating. This man, of course, is showing all the signs of real grief, real pain. His misery, his sadness is affecting him at a deep, real level. It's a sad, sad picture that's being drawn for us here. If we read these verses, let, 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 let our minds wonder and put an image of this man. He's a poor, poor soul. Far from God, far from help. His days are passing away. He can't eat, he can't sleep. He's just stuck here in misery. And the question has to be asked, does anyone here, even now, do you know what it feels? In a small sense even, in your own situation, can you identify with this man's cry? Can only you know the answer to that. To Christians here, Christian, do you know what it's like to... to to, f to feel far from God, to feel as if God is no longer listening to you, to feel as if your prayers aren't even leaving the room you're in, to feel as if God has turned his back on you and on your life, that he has no more care for you. Perhaps are you feeling that way just now? You, you've got dressed and come out to church and good on you for coming here. The hardest thing to do sometimes is to come to church when you're feeling that way. Right now, as you're here just now, are you feeling far from God? If you are, then perhaps you know in some way the condition this man was in. It's not important, but there's some discussion in, in verse 6 as to what 
uh, actual animals be mentioned, but in a way the image is clear. Verse 6, I'm like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl of waste places. This image of this bird living alone in the wilderness, this bird just all day, all night, screeching out and no one to hear it, no one to care for it, living in the desert, living in the wilderness, living in the wasteland, that word quite literally meaning uh, living in a place of ruins. It's the same word as used in Isaiah 58, verse 12, in a bit more of a positive way. It talks about your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. So this bird is here in ancient ruins. No sign of life, completely alone in the wilderness. And he feels like this poor bird, calling out, no one to hear him, no one to care for him. He's alone, he's sleepless, he's not eating, he's not drinking. And the pain doesn't even end there for this poor man. We see later on, he's even being, uh, in verse 8, he's being taunted by his enemies. And all this results, of course, in him feeling as if, as if he has nothing left to drink but his own tears. Nothing to eat but, but ashes. Of course, ashes being again and again in that culture and throughout scripture, a symbol of mourning, a symbol of, of complete brokenness. Uh, we see that, of course, in, uh, in terms of a cultural thing in, in the story of, of Jonah. Of course, when Jonah goes to Nineveh and the king of Nineveh repents and he, makes, he, he dresses himself in sackcloth and ashes and makes his subjects do the same. Ashes as a symbol of, of, of brokenness, of, of, of desire for help, of saying, I'm, I've got nothing here left. God, please help. Drinking tears. He feels like he's eating ashes. And it gets worse and worse, and it gets to verse 10. And we read this strange trait. Look with me, please, to verse 10. Uh, because of your indignation and anger, you have taken me up and thrown me down. And we think, well, it's getting a bit, a bit hard to read now, isn't it? Is, is, is he blaming God? Because of your indignation and your ang- and anger, for you have taken me up and thrown me down. Is he blaming God? Is he accusing God? Well, that's not the tone at all that comes across. What's the tone that comes across? He's stating the fact. He's aware, even in his misery, he's aware that God is still in control. That God is still over and above all things going on with him. That God is still in sovereign, kingly control, even of his tough, tough situation. It's okay for, for, for me to sit, stand here and say that to you, but... If you're going through something like this, if you know what it is to feel like this man, then that's what the Bible says to you. Don't listen to some, some one thing student. But that's what God's word says to you just now. That he is in control. That doesn't help, perhaps, ease the pain in a, in a real sense. But for the Christian, that's a comfort. That God is not unaware of your situation. He's not unaware of who you are, what you're going through. So he's not accusing God, but he's acknowledging that God's in control. And of course, I think Job probably comes to mind uh, to most people. We think of God allowing certain trials to take place in the life of someone. We could argue that no one has ever had it worse, humanly speaking, than that man Job. And what is his response to all that take place to him? We see in, in Job 13, verse 15, where Job talks about God. He says about God, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Even if God will take my life, even if God will will take me down to the earth, even if God will just destroy my world, I will still hope in him. I think it takes faith, it takes a real Christian understanding to understand what that means. It's hard to to view that from the outside looking in. For any here who who are not Christians, it's quite hard to understand what Job meant by that. But he trusted his God so much. He knew his God so well that even though you slay me, I will hope in him. I will hope in you. And this same thought is, is it reflected again and again, reflected, of course, throughout the whole of Psalm 42 and ever similar psalm to this psalm here. The psalmist, he's not angry with God. He's not protesting a fact. He's just stating it as a fact. God is in control. You are doing this you, allow, you are allowing this to happen in my life. It's tough, it's hard, but you're allowing it. 
Now we might be sitting here just now and perhaps rightly thinking, well this sounds completely unfair. This sounds completely, with respect, ridiculous. God is letting this man go through all of this. He's leaving this man feeling so alone. And the writer just calmly acknowledges, well, it's all from God. We might be tempted to think we would choose perhaps stronger words or different words. Or... But then look with me please to verse 12 onwards. I think the first few verses of verse 12, it changes the whole perspective for us. And this is the perspective the psalmist had. The psalmist stops mid-track. He's verse 1 into verse 11. He's talking about himself, a situation that's also bad. Then in verse 12, he stops. And what does he say? But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. Yes, I'm in pain. Yes, I'm grieving. Yes, I'm going through this tough situation. Yes, my life is misery. I can't eat. I can't drink. I'm all alone. My enemies are at the gate constantly. But I know, even through all this, that you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. That you are king. That you are sovereign. That you rule over all things. God isn't just there. He knows. He knows what this man's going through. He knows right now what you're going through. If you right now are one of his people, he knows every aspect of your life. He knows your pain. But he also knows why you're going through it. And again, don't listen to me, but listen to God's own word. Even in the most miserable situations, that he is still working in your life. And for any Christian here this evening who's going through something, um, perhaps only you know about, perhaps something that you've kept in your mind, or perhaps it's physical health or mental health, or anything else, situation that's tough that you're going through just now. Perhaps you're just feeling far from God for no particular reason or for a reason you know about this has to be our constant prayer our constant refrain our constant reminder that yes I am miserable yes my life is fond of it but you O oh Lord you are enthroned forever because without that what hope do we have absolutely nothing absolutely nothing if we are viewing God as someone who's just passively involved in our lives who, who, who cares occasionally and who's in charge occasionally but Apart from that, it doesn't really do much. Then our God is so small, he is completely useless. That's not the Bible, that's not the God, the Bible, or the psalmist, indeed even here, paints for us. The, the God of the Bible, the God of the psalmist, is enthroned forever. He is over and above and rules over everything else. Nothing is a surprise to him. Nothing is too small for him to see. Nothing is too, too quick for him not to understand. Nothing is too dark for him not to see into. He is enthroned and ruling over and above and through all things. When it comes down to verses 12 down to verse 14, we have to, uh, well, well, verse 13 down, we could say it's, um, we're not giving too much information here what's happening. He's, he's talking now, of course, about, about, about his, his, his place, about Zion, about um, the destruction of a temple and destruction of a city and we're seeing this sense that uh, that at least part of his distress is coming from the fact that his beloved Zion, his beloved place where God dwells, his beloved city, is now nothing more than stones and ruins. If you look with me uh, to verse 13 and 14, uh, we see here in verse 14 really, uh, for your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. The idea that this place, uh, Zion, we, we, we know here, it's been destroyed and he's saying well even the place where people once worshipped you there's nothing left but stones and dust the question is what do we here this evening in Carloway or even Lewis what has silent what has the dust and stones of this broken down place got to do with us this evening why should we care to understand Bring our minds to Hebrews 12 and 
chapter, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. We're talking about the church. The writer says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in the festal gathering. Of course, in the time of the writer, the time of the psalmist here, Jerusalem and Zion is where the people could meet with God. That was where God would meet his people, where they could sacrifice to him, where, where the days of, of, of the, the temp- temple days and, and tabernacle days, where God still showed himself physically in some sense in the Shekinah glory of his people, where God was still very much there. Where once a year they could come and offer up their, their sacrifices to the nation, where daily they offer up sacrifices later on. This is where the psalmist met with God. And he's saying, even that place, it's stones and dust. It's been destroyed. So when, Sam, when, when the psalmist, of course, is writing about Zion, he's talking about the church. The place where God is with his people. And he's lamenting over the, the destruction of the holy city. It's been torn down. It's been attacked. And the attackers, they, they, they think they've won. We sang uh, in Psalm 80, Earlier on, and the same that Sam talks about the same situation taking place where it's all been destroyed, it's all been ruined. The outside enemies attacked us, and it's all gone. And the enemy thinks they've won, and the attackers they have won in their eyes. You know what's left but stones and dust. Zion's been destroyed. Where God meets His people, it's all gone. Nothing left but stones and dust. And for we we're saying earlier on, and and talks to Hulish, it's much the same for us today in many ways. That in a similar sense. Um, when people look to, to you and me, we look at Christians, and look at the church, what on earth is this place? What on earth are we? Silly people meeting together twice or three times a week. Silly people reading a book that's a few thousand years old. What is this? Silly people praying to a man, uh, a God who doesn't exist, a God in their minds. Worshipping a man who lived 2,000 years ago, a few thousand miles away, in some awful wee Middle Eastern town. They view us as nothing more than stones and dust, a load of rubbish. Not precious, not useful, nothing important at all in any way whatsoever. Perhaps in another sense we see ourselves as nothing more than stones or dust. We look to our own personal lives, our own personal walk, our own personal sin, our own personal wandering away, and, and we mourn how easily we, we all just fall and crumble away, how easily we, we, we seem to give up so quickly on following our Saviour, who we claim to love so much, but yet we, we crumble at the first instance of, of issue or problem. We perhaps look around at the church itself and see, perhaps we, we mourn at, at places where the gospel's been torn down and replaced with man-made gospel. Let's be careful to note how the psalmist describes this dust and these stones. Yes, it's all in bits. Yes, there's dust and stones, but they're still part of the city. And they are precious. They are precious. And these stones and this dust, although it's broken down and looked on as nothing important, to God it's precious. To those who are not part of the church as of yet perhaps you think you, you, you come here and praise God you do but you, you, you don't quite understand what's so important about Jesus what's so important about loving him worshipping him what's, look at these Christians they're all just so just, just hypocrites they're just full of just lies and the truth is we are we are, we often are but God calls us precious Dust and stones, though we are, we are precious to God. We are being built up together as precious stones. We had Ephesians 2 this morning. Let's again look to Ephesians 2 this time, verse 20. Talking about the church. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Of who Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. God uses us dust and stones as we are to build his church as we have it here he will build up Zion in verse 16 he will build up Zion 
he appears in his glory. What well, God builds up will never again be destroyed. Yes, it will attack. The church is always attacked. From within and without. But we know that God's church we will never be destroyed. Not because of who we are, but because of who our God is. Nothing will remove us from the church of God. Nothing will destroy his people. Nothing will destroy his church. Because it's based on our eternal saviour. We can be sure it will last from now to all eternity. These are not just nice words for us. These are gospel realities. When we see perhaps the church facing a time of stagnation, a time of, 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 of slowing down in the west, what do we see in the east? Tough times in the east, but God is growing his church at a rate we have never seen in the west. Solid Christian churches appearing in places we never thought Christianity even had an impact. God is always building his church. He's always building his church. After the, this wonderful promise of, of God keeping his church, we then see those who, who make up the church, or there are those who are doomed to die. Who are we just now? We heard this morning in Ephesians 2. Who are we? Well, verses uh, 19 and verse 20. When God looked down, what did he see? He saw those prisoners like us who were doomed to die. And he rescued us. We have in Psalm 107 a wonderful psalm of God's rescue. He, he broke the chains of our, the, the, the iron chains away from us and he broke them to bits. He burst their chains apart, Psalm 107, verse 15, talking about the prisoners in darkness. When God looks at us, he doesn't see the finished article, he sees prisoners doomed to die. And that's, of course, where he rescues us from. We may be dust and stones, we're dust and stones being used by our God for his glorious purpose. According to his perfect plan, not one of us is out of place. Not here and not in the wider church. So we see how the psalmist is, he starts off in despair, starts off in misery, then comes this turning point in verse 12 where we see that God is reigning through all time and through all power. And then we see the situation of his beloved Zion. But no sooner has the psalmist been praising God than in verse 23, look when please, verse 23. Praising God, praising God, praising God's great care. And again in verse 23, what do we see? He's back again to his misery and distress. He has broken my strength in mid-course. He has shortened my days. Oh my God, I say, take me not away in the midst of my days. You whose years endure throughout all generations. He's broken my strength. He's shortened my days. And I'm sure we all, if we're honest, know this feeling so well. Even in the midst of our praise, even in the midst of us worshipping God, saying, God, you've rescued me, God, you're incredible to me, you've shown your love to me, even in the midst of that, we then find ourselves at the same time thinking, oh man, I'm still in a bad situation. We find ourselves slipping back into the same old sins, slipping back into the same old situations, finding ourselves in danger again, whatever the cause of our distress is. No sooner are we praising God for delivering us that we need to be delivered yet again. But this time the psalmist doesn't get too far in his complaints. So in verse 23 he starts, he starts emphasising again the situation then in verse 24 he's back again now to praising God. Oh my God, I say. At the end of verse 24 he, he acknowledges God as the one who endures for all generations. Verse 25 he acknowledges God of old, you lay the foundations of the earth, the heavens of the work of your hands. He acknowledges that God is in full control yet again. When he sees his own thoughts, when he sees his own worries compared to God's eternity and God's power, he stopped in his tracks yet again. A quote here from uh, Matthew Henry, wonderful quote. A short one here again, saying, Weeping must never hinder worship. That's not saying we never weep. It's not saying we can't do both at the same time. 
what it is saying is because we're in a bad situation, that never takes away from us our, our, our responsibility to worship our God. The psalmist goes from pain to praise, back to pain and back to praise again. In doing that, we can identify perhaps with him even more. As our life goes on, as our days, even as our perhaps hour goes on, we find ourselves going from time of pain to praise, to pain to praise, but always realising in the end that God is God. That he has not changed in our situation. That even though we are suffering, that he is still the God who saved us, the God who has called us by name, the God who promises to never leave his people. We also have to be careful as Christians not to, to place uh, our salvation or our, our, our assurance of salvation on our feelings. How quickly do our feelings change? I'm sure since this morning till this evening, we have changed our feelings several times. How we feel perhaps on a Monday morning going to work, it's not how we feel on a Friday evening, uh, or how we feel even Monday at lunchtime. Our feelings change, our feelings can be impacted by anything and everything. Don't base your salvation or your assurance on your feelings, base it on God's truth, which never changes. Easy to say, hard to do, but it's good to remember when you're feeling far from God, when you're feeling attacked on every side, trust in God as unchanging truth, not in your changing situation or in your changing feelings. Even during trials, the psalmist can only say, God, you reign forever. And the psalmist, of course, then finishes off the last few verses with praising of God, of old laid foundations. They will perish, you remain. They wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, they will pass away. You are the same. Your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring to be established before you. We touched this morning on Romans chapter 1. In Romans 1 we also see the, the great idea that God's power is seen in creation. And in these few verses we see God's incredible creation power. Uh, we know that much of, of creation of course is beyond our understanding. I've got a personal love of stars and I love just coming home just now and I was out last night with the telescope looking at the stars. It's wonderful, incredible. But I will never know anything about them. Suppose I spend the rest of my life, whatever years the Lord gives me, looking and studying them. I'm still not the wiser of any of them, really. I can perhaps name a few and talk about a few systems and that's it. But there's billions and billions more than I'll ever even understand or realise exist. The wonderful closing statement of his psalm is just adoration to God. That one day he will return. One day he will just, the earth and the heavens and all creation itself, it will be worn away like a garment. And God will change them like a robe. And that is a hope, of course, for Christians today. That one day God will come back and he will transform our world into a new world, new creation, new heavens and new earth. He will come and make perfect all things. That's the hope of Krishna. What a hope we have. What an end to the psalm. That even in my pain, even in my misery, even in my distress, the hope is one day all will be perfect. One day God will come back. Our Saviour will, will return and all things will be made new. First Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, the voice of the archangel, the sound of trumpets. Second Peter 3 verse 10 But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burnt up and dissolved and the earth also and the works that are done on it will be exposed. On that day, the church of God will be completed. Right now, we're a suffering church. We're a church that goes astray. We're a church that gets so many things wrong as God's people. On that day, his church will be complete. When the last person is saved, he's going to be saved. When God is, is, has completed his people as a gift to his son. 
and his son receives his people as his uh, uh, eternal inheritance, then everything will stop. And we will then see verses we have in verse 20, Revelation 21, verse 3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the former things have passed away. And the one seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. This is the Christian's hope just now. God will help his people right now on earth. Of course he does. We, we, as Christians, we can, I'm sure, uh, agree to that. Uh, right now, in, in terms of suffering, in terms of trial, God is with his people, helps his people. But what's our hope? Our, our hope is looking forward to that final day when God will reign completely, when our Saviour returns to take home his, his own. And the question has to be asked, and again, I've said this this, this morning, it's, no, it's not just something we say because we have to say it. This is something we say because we mean it. I said it before, I said it again this morning, I said it again tonight. We can be so comfortable in church, so comfortable in our pews, so comfortable in our nice suits, so comfortable in all this procedure, we forget the reality of the gospel. This is life and death. And if that offends you in any way, then it's not me I'm offensive, it's the word of God. For Christians here, we go through tough times. We know, supposing the earth itself gives way beneath our feet, as the psalmist says, we have hope, but we're secured on our never-changing God. If as of yet you're here just now and you're not a Christian, where is your hope? Seriously, please ask yourself that. Where is your hope? In this world where everything can change so quickly as we see ourselves, where, where our family and friends who love us dearly, but who can let us down so much also, where is your hope based? The reality is that Christians here and non-Christian alike, we all face similar, if not exact same struggles in life. Everyone here will go through times of, of, of distress and trial and mourning, worries about family, worries about finance, worries about our jobs, worries about everything else. But what's the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian in terms of hope? The Christian's hope is secure. What do you hope for when you go through times of trial? Where is your hope based on? How do you know you have anyone who actually cares for you at all? A simple plea. A simple plea is go home again. Read this psalm. Talk to anyone you know as a Christian. And our prayer here is that you would place your hope and your trust in the one whose days do last forever. The one who the psalm glorifies so much. The one who the psalm talks so much about. The one who is enthroned forever. You would come to know him and come to trust him, and come to love him, and come to call him your God and your Saviour. Let's bow our heads now, a word of prayer. Uh, Lord God, we come before you now. We thank you for your word. Lord, you forgive me for anything I said that was incorrect. Lord, we give you praise. The power is not in the, the, the preacher, but the power is in your word, and your word alone. Lord, we're very mindful of that as we come to your word. We see such great concepts, and we see such great truths of, of your eternal reality. We find ourselves in awe, and failing to understand or to grasp even perhaps a small part of it. But Lord, we praise you for it. You are our eternal God, yet you reign forever. And even in the trials and sufferings of our, our lives, Lord, that you are not um, removed from it. And you maintain your presence with your people. I also thank you that you are still offering your gospel hope to all who cry out for help. At your ear, it's not shut to any who call it to you. At any here this evening, who, who, who as of yet don't know you, but who wish to come to worship you as a Lord and Saviour, Lord, that you are willing and you're able to save them, to hear them and to transform their lives. Lord, help us now to lose sight of that simple gospel hope, that simple gospel message. All these things are... Precious name's sake. I mean.